You're listening to Exposure on Radio X. I'm John Kennedy, and that is Interpol with Fine Mess from the A Fine Mess EP, which has just come out recently. And I'm very pleased to say that with me in the studio right now is Daniel Kessler from Interpol. Hello, Daniel. Hey, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure, and thanks for finding time in your ridiculously busy schedule. Leeds, Brighton, Glastonbury, and then the rest of Europe um, is is just around the corner. Um, so <laughs> I really appreciate it. Not at all. Um, but it's been a long time. I was trying to work out. It's probably something like 15 years since we saw each other. Now, I've seen other members of the band. I've seen Paul most recently when he did that Banks and Steels mm. project with the RZA, right. um, which I really liked. But... but it's, I, I, it's nothing personal, Daniel. It's just the way it's worked out. <laughs> yeah. um, but Such is life. I, I'm pleased that it is you here today because I, I want a, a little trip down memory lane in some ways. Um, I mean, obviously, you're in a good place. The band are in a good place, constantly touring. Um, just put out a new EP, having already just put out a new album only last year. Um, so, you know, it's, it's firing on all cylinders again. I mean, it is. You know, we've... Um it's it's something that I, I feel very grateful for the the fact that yeah it's we have six records into this and several EPs and soul touring and you know and and the fact that it's it's something that you have to appreciate and and not take for granted in this day and age when it's you know the industry has changed quite a bit since our first record and so has this world so it's just something that I I think I save and I really think about even more so than I even did back then it, you know it's just it, it has deep meaning for me but yeah the band is in a good place it was uh, it was great making the Marauder it was a really wonderful full experience working Dave Fridman and also doing the, the EP with him and you know we've been pretty much on tour for the most part for the last year but you know it's been fun playing shows getting along well life's not too bad yeah that's good and and is this like with uh, El Pinto uh, where you know you, you had so many songs that you recorded and it's like oh we've got all these extras what are we going to do with them we'll put them out as an EP you know what truthfully while we're writing uh, just writing in the writing period before we went into the studio to, to make Marauder definitely thinking about doing something and not just doing a record doing something in addition like in, as far as in the scope of a couple of years so something that I certainly was very much mindful of like I really want to do what it was going to be whether it was going to be EP more or less I didn't know but I knew I, I really want to try to be a bit more ambitious with that but that said, you still have to do it and you still have to have a, you know, a, 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 a fertile like writing period together. And, and, and but we did, you know, it was really like it was just so it, it was just we didn't hit many to like red lights. We we're always kind of having new ideas and moving forward. And so such we started kind of like working on a, a lot of material. And then we started kind of planning having an album and then, you know, like uh, like eight months, nine months later having an EP. So it was just something kind of to plan out and also not make it so it was just extra material that to make it to the record because that really was not the case with a fine mess EP. These were songs that we could have decided to put on the record. They're all, you know, we feel like they're as good as anything a Marauder, but we felt like we wanted, they, they should be on something separate. Their, their identity is something separate and we wanted to kind of pace it out that way. So it was, um, yeah, it was just something a little bit different for us to do. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it seems a bit more raw on a fine mess. It, it feels more raw, for sure, yeah. Yeah, it sounds almost like a band starting out, in a way. The way it's recorded, it's a bit more um, visceral, somehow. Yeah, no, 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 it, it is. It's uh, And even where, you know, Paul's voice is... Uh, it's you know qu quite a bit distorted on the you know effect wise. So it's definitely got like kind of I think like a, a garagey sort of very raw feel as as you put it. Yeah, yeah, I really like it because of that because it, it seems as if there's a real energy to it and an excitement, an exuberance yeah. um, to the band and the way that you're performing. I mean, also I should say though, just for like when we mo we wrote we we're writing Marauder before we went into the studio. Um, it felt that way too. It felt like there was a, a raw energy. Um, the songs were just kind of like bouncing off the walls. We, you know, we're just from the rehearsal play, you know, space. We still were, we still write songs in a, you know, rehearsal studio for us to be ready in rehearsal space, I should say. For us to be ready to go into the studio, the songs basically have to have the foundation of form and, you know, and, and be almost ready, like live ready. So in that scale, we haven't really changed so much of the way we approach writing music. It's a bit harder. Certainly there's, ways in these days where you can be like, you know, we'll figure out the middle section later in Pro Tools and just put it together and so forth. You know, something like that. And it, it, there's, it, there's, there's good reason for doing that because it just, I don't know, it gives you like a little bit of perspective and so forth. But I do like the fact that we're still in there and the song really has to prove itself before it becomes a song. And so with that, though, I did notice while we we're writing, you know, midst of writing just material that, that I just felt like everything felt very raw and immediate and urgent. And, um, 
you know, and then I think when we actually went to work, you know, with Dave, uh, I think that's something he heard too. And he saw, you know, he saw that as something that he wanted to capture and hence why uh, we actually recorded like the, you know, Marauder and the, the EP onto two inch tape because it's, it's something that, you know, we were, we were tight, we were ready and you could do that. We didn't have to take too many takes. We could limit ourselves in terms of how many tracks, how many parts we could do. And it was something at first when you're, you know, you start discussing it with the producer, you're like, yeah, there goes the safety net, you know, you can't do like eight guitar tracks and, you know, figure out which one's best. You have to be like, no, you have to, you have to record the best one. Yeah. <laughs> so in that sense, it puts it on you. But then once you settle into it, you're like, oh, you're prepared for this. And there's also, even if there's errors, they're good errors. They're like happy errors. And so there's, you know, it's like a lot of like life and, and um, it's not a perfect record in that sense, but it's definitely a human record. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's have a, another track from it then. This is No Big Deal. It is Interpol on Exposure. It is Interpol with No Big Deal, another selection from A Fine Mess, the new EP, which has just come out recently. I'm John Kennedy. You're listening to Radio X. I have Daniel Kessler from Interpol with me tonight, taking a little outing away from his busy touring schedule. Um, and um, we, you are, in effect, the instigator of this band. You created Interpol. I did start the band, that's true. Yeah. So you're the key member, really, Daniel. I can't really, I would definitely <laughs> not say that at all. I think that's the thing, it's like, uh, you know, Interpol is really, it, it's it's a sum of all, all its parts and it was founded on that and it was really meant to be this way. I mean, even when I was looking out for people, you know, I'd already just done a demo basically, but, you know, by myself, I played every instrument besides the drums and that, you know, I was kind of happy with the results and it started, you know, I started seeing myself change as a, you know, the way I was approaching writing songs. Um, but from that, I did, I learned that, well, it, this could work, but I kind of would rather find, you know, a collaboration where, you know, one person has one idea and one person gets inspired from that idea. And then the third person gets inspired by the second person's idea. That said, for me, it was, it was very ambitious to have that sort of desire to find that sort of collaboration because I couldn't even find any bandmates to make them up in New York. It was more like, you know, I was definitely feeling a bit down on my luck, but you know, I was, what I, what it did, you know, I was fortunate enough to actually find that you know like essentially interpol is that that's what it is and that's sort of what we still are and it's i don't know how that came to be but it's something i mean even the early days you know before we actually were you know we, we got signed we were banned from you know many years we got we started we played our first show in march 98 like a long time ago we didn't put out our first record till august 2002 so you know it was really like down there without much hope in between that time period as far as we weren't gaining more and more fans you know per show it wasn't until like the last you know year or so before we got signed that it started growing a little bit um you didn't really have much reason to to think that there was you know even the opportunity to you you would have the opportunity to make a record let alone there'd be people interested in that record but at the same time i did have for me like i did have this sort of inner sort of um comfort just knowing that well if no one ever hears this like no one ever hears this at all i'm getting enough out of it and the hardest part was really just finding these guys truthfully to kind of make this sort of collaboration and and then i had this hope that hopefully if we can just kind of stick going forward sooner or later you know we'll get we'll, we'll find that opportunity to make a record and, and so forth so it's a strange thing you know i was like kind of hopeful and ambitious about what i wanted to be like this concoction um and it's just really fortunate that she came to be you know yeah, well, 21, 22 years later, crazy. Uh, the band is still going and has a bigger audience than ever, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's something I feel really, you know, I, I never took any of this for granted, especially, you know, if, you, if you're kind of sort of in the minor leagues for so long without anyone, you know, paying attention to you, every single record label saying no several times, even Matador said, you know, uh, no twice before they said yes on the the third, you know, the demo, and it wasn't like we, the first demo has songs from our first record, like, you know, not mm -hmm. inferior recordings of it, mind you, but like, so we had PDA and we had Roland and things like that. Our identity was there on that very first demo from 98. So, uh, you don't really have reason to think that, you know, you just got to keep going, but it's, it's something. So when you, we finally did get signed and we finally put out our first record, you know, to me, that was already like, I was so grateful about that. I just, it was, you know, it was my dream, you know, especially with Matter, which was my, my favorite label, let alone everyone, you know, there being an audience that seemed interested in our music. So I was, I also, for, you know, I was always very appreciative and I really savored it, but then even more so now where it's, it's just, it's incredible that you get, you know, you get to go up there and play music and people have this reaction to it. And you can see even in the audience, like, you know, changes, like the demographics are different age-wise. And that's like, you know, it's very tricky in this day and age to, 
to have you know a band that people are discovering you know um, you know while maybe they're like they're currently teenagers you know we've mm-hmm. all had those experiences when we were teenagers where those bands became very important in your lives and so I'm not saying that's happening to for us with other with teenagers but I do see you know a, a, a wide range in in ages and that's like something I'm really happy about and grateful for in this crazy you know digital age of ours yeah yeah and that's part of the beauty of having a history and having experience and also being um, full of forward mem- Momentum. You know, you, you're moving forward all the time as a band, yeah. putting out new material so people can hear a new song and then rediscover uh, the, the past, as I mean, it were. I mean, the thing is that, you know, as much as I know people are very interested in, and I'm always happy to talk about stuff from, like, you know, the the early days in New York in that time. That's, I mean, it's, you know, I had great, great memories and this great music that came out of there. I think, in, personally, I haven't really looked back that much, you know, on that. You know, because it's more, I do feel like when we're really still moving forward, and that might be a thing that, like, you know, every band that still makes records says, but it's just the truth. We've never really sat there. We, you know, we could reflect or remember that story or this and that. But ultimately, when we're in a room, like, writing music, we don't really actually discuss anything. And that's something that we, we never really discussed that much even back in the day. It's just, there's no real time to, for discussion because we're actually more or less paying attention to what's happening in the room and what's, and, you know, that's a conversation. It's not really through words so much. It's more about, like, like, uh, what's where we do we want to take this? Blah blah blah, and that's really just happening through through action, through playing music, and and it's um it's also something I'm really like happy and grateful for is that we never really hit those writing walls. We've always been in the room, being like it just momentum is just taking us to the next steps, and this is why we keep making you know records. I mean, this is why we keep doing this. It's not because this is our occupation or just the way we you know conduct our lives. It's more of like oh no, we still you know we're really invested and invigorated by our process and. And, and feeling like we're moving forward and we're doing better, you know, the, the last thing is eclipsing the previous thing. Whether people feel that way or not, that's, you know, subjective. But for us as artists, I think we really feel that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, this history, I feel, is, is kind of almost intertwined with this radio show. So Exposure, this show, is now 20 years old this year. Crazy. Um, and you came over, and as far as I remember, your first gig in the British Isles was in Scotland. Yes. Um, because you'd established some kind of male correspondence with members of Mogwai or something like that? No, I mean, I, 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 I used to work at record labels. And uh, I worked at Mogwai's first U.S. record label. It's like, uh, you know, it's like really, really young and they were even younger. And um, and they came over and I was a big fan. I really loved, I mean, even before they had the, their first record, Young Team, they had this... Uh, this thing called Ten Rapid, a collection of their EPs. At least in the, I don't know if it was worldwide, if it was just the US thing, just in, introduced them. But um, I love that record, you know. And then they came over and they played their first show in uh, in New York, actually inside uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, when you could do shows there. And um, it was great. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're an amazing live band. And then it became very, you know, close to those guys and very friendly. And um, and then through them, I got to meet, you know, Chemical Underground, and uh, who was their, you know, label back, you know, the, at least at one point in time in the early days or the label and 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 then uh you know he started like yeah liaison i gave them our first demo and some of the members of the delgado slash chemical underground liked it and they were supportive they didn't want to necessarily release it but they were supportive and then over you know a couple of years like i think around 2000 they, they established this series called the the fucked id series and um, they invited us to participate and so they actually took some songs from that very first demo and some songs from our very our second demo and they put it onto uh you know this this limited edition cd and and 12 inch and that was the beginning and then so for me you know and then after that it was like oh my god finally something's happening some sort of like you know reason to to continue something like that and then we actually kind of you know you know every band that's just sort of not touring out doing things especially back then you're just you're just dreaming about like leaving you know going on tour and doing something playing shows outside your your city and um so we kind of forced a tour into the uk it wasn't necessarily a good business decision as far as financially we pulled like all the money that we had like you know from we'd earned from playing some shows the meager amounts of money that were getting paid from like you know the door and then we, we collectively also put our personal money that we had and we were super broke at the time and and uh we came over here and, and chemical underground was like really amazing really supportive connected us with um a tour manager who became our tour manager forever stevie dreads who's still like one of those delightful people I've you know I've ever met and um and then yeah we, we played our first show at King Tut's in, in Glasgow and then uh came made our way down and um yeah and then we saw you yeah and then also part of the thing too is we did a appeal session right and it was very exciting because obviously it was actually you know in hindsight it was it was towards the end of 
you know, Peel Sessions and sadly the, the loss of John Peel. And, uh, but it was, it was amazing AA to get to do this. We couldn't believe that, you know, they actually agreed to let us do a Peel Session. And so that was really exciting just to go down there and, and to record there. And then the second side was like, oh, they pay you a little bit of money. I'm like, okay, so that will actually help finance this trip so you can come over here because we lost a ton of money just coming over here. But, uh, you know, it was sort of those two things, but it was great. And then, yeah, we were in London for a few days and played our first show at the Barfly. Yeah, which was my gig. Yeah, yeah that's it was your right. gig. Exactly. So exactly. Like no, right, 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 right. Of course, it's, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it, and, and it's something that I kind of take for granted or I forget about. And then it's like, oh, actually, Interpol's first London show was for exposure at the Barfly. And, and again, I have to give a lot. Yeah. And we, did, we had a little chat we did an interview as well at the time I remember no I remember coming here and, yeah. Or, yeah coming yeah and and also again Kevin Clone Ground was really helpful and helped you know introduce us and connect us and so yeah. forth so it was really good hearted of them to to like our band even though we were unknown and so forth and to be supportive that way yeah yeah but that trip ended up being quite instrumental i think in 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 cementing this burgeoning new york scene that we're all reading and hearing about and you were a vital part of it and i think it also meant that um you know you kind of put down the foundations for future success even though you probably were very out of pocket and trying to work out well why are we traveling across the world when we can't yeah. get a proper audience back home but it, it really shows that it, it's worthwhile it, it, it was. I mean, even on that tour, it's funny. We got booked to do something called, like, on the way down to, um, it was in Peterborough. It was, uh, but it was a Sunday. It was, like, Easter Sunday. And it was called Crucifest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we walked into it. It was, like, and it was, like, it looked like, it was, because this was, like, the age where there was a bit of, um, it's like, new metal was, was pretty big. It was, this is, like, early 2001. And we walked in there, and there was, like, these two guys on stage with, like, masks on their faces and just, like, you know, and screaming and so far. And we could, you know, we just seemed like we were, like, you know, we're, at, we're you know, we're fishes out of water. It wasn't, this is not the place meant to be. So we're, like, we faked that Paul had, like, laryngitis or something that like, got out of there, and, you know, and just <laughs> went to London. And then, it, and so it looked especially bleak right before that. So it was before we'd actually met and before we'd done anything. It was kind of like, why are we doing this? And then the funny thing about that is, so we had to, like, crash someone's floor and someone didn't even really know who helped put together the tour. And then, um, but that was the first time someone played, I think maybe the person had, like, the... Uh, one of the, the strokes is first seven inches maybe it was like modern age and that was the first time I ever heard the strokes it wasn't in New York it was like right there so that's weird isn't yeah it? I was just sitting there I remember like sitting there in this like hopelessness of like wow this tour is just not going well and what were you we thinking and being here and being like you know, someone we didn't even know is like floor and all just like curled up and like the feet after like, and then like putting on this, uh, the seven inch and listening to uh, the strokes that we'd heard about, you know, obviously at that point they'd already started, um, you know, started name was far before their, you know, their first record came out and long before we ever met them, but it was, uh, they had a bit of buzz and they, you know, this one, the, yeah, the UK was very much covering them and very excited, but it, it was very early. Yeah, yeah, wow. There's, there's so much to talk about and so much to play. I think we should play... Was PDA on that first Chemical Underground? Yes, it was. Like, let's play PDA. So this is Interpol with PDA on Exposure Radio X. It is Interpol on Exposure Radio X. I'm John Kennedy. I've got Daniel from Interpol here. Um, and we're talking about old times, new times, future <laughs> times. But you were just going to say, you were we, we've just been talking about the, you know, that first yeah. UK visit. Well, since you just played PDA, I was mm. going to say too, that was, that was pretty much, like that was the first song I ever wrote for Interpol was, was PDA. Before like even the band, like as far as just the, the, the guitar progression. And I think for me, when I was writing that, was uh, sort of like kind of the change of the way I was like thinking about music and approaching it. And I could see then I was like, okay, things were deviating courses and my interests were deviating a little bit or not even, not even deviating, I was saying progressing. It was really about progression. Uh, and so it was sort of like a song that was like, okay, this is this is something to hold on to. And from there, it was like one of the first songs I think ever. It was probably the first song I ever played for the guys when, you know, I was trying to see if they'd be interested in starting a band. Wow, amazing. When you were trying to recruit people into Yeah, these are all strangers. Idea. I mean, when I recruit everyone, these are all like, you know, these are people I didn't really know. I mean, Paul, I didn't know any of them. You know, I just kind of went up to both. I mean, Paul, I, I met in, in Paris, really enough, at like this university program in the summertime. And he was just, you know, he's like barely 18. He was like, a, you know, just finished high school. But I'd been, you know, in New York, just kind of like down my luck, trying to find people and just not playing 
music, you know, there's people, you know, you get into a rehearsal room like, oh, yeah, I like music. And they're just super casual about it. But for me, it was sort of like life and death. I really wanted to, didn't necessarily want to, it wasn't like about making it or doing this or that. It's just more about expression and like having this deep need. But then I saw, you know, I'm, I, I, from that, from this frustration, I think I established was less about technical ability. It was more about sensibility. And so I really had that in my brain. And there was something about Paul. He was like super young, but he carried himself you know he, he's very comfortable on people much older than him and he's he, there's something about him he's got a different kind of air and so even then there's uh, they had like this thing about him i was had i was i had you know i had a sense about him and a curiosity so i started like broaching the subject on music and he said he played guitar and sang and i flagged that and same thing you know when when i met carlos is like just in a classroom and just had a sense about him and went up to him and i'm a very shy person to this day it's a hard thing for me to go talk to a stranger but um I just had to because I was like so frustrated and again like despair makes you do things and so I you know started a conversation about music just with a, an inkling yeah that is amazing especially considering that you know you were in New York which is a massive place you were a I student know. so in, in a sense you should be meeting fellow students who could be like-minded um, and yet uh, in the midst of all that you couldn't find the right no, people no and I really uh, yeah. And also weren't aware of these other people and these other bands like The Strokes who were probably within a stone's throw kind of um, away from you. And you're all independently working. And that's amazing. We're going to take a quick break. We've got more conversation with Daniel Moore from Interpol on the way. Exposure. It is the Rover. It is Interpol on Exposure Radio X from the Marauder album. I'm John Kennedy and Daniel Kessler from Interpol is here tonight. Um, wow, what a trip down memory lane. Amazing things. What did you think of uh, Lizzie Goodman's book, Meet Me in the Bathroom? Because that was a great, um, as a fan, just he hearing those first-hand accounts of, of these different people. It, it, it kind of ties in with what you're saying, because all these different disparate souls working towards things, but completely unaware of each other. I mean, I didn't read the book, for one. Mm, fair um, enough. You I, are I, in it, so you don't... <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to contribute it because, mm. I mean, Lizzie is a friend and, and she definitely put a lot of time into it. And, I mean, I did my interview of her eons ago. So, you know, you just, you never know in those situations. I certainly did not expect people to be that curious about that time and uh, and and just throughout the world. I mean, I've been in Japan when people have had that book, like, you know, with post-it notes all over it, asking me questions and so forth. So it's really interesting to see this. And, you know, as I, I was mentioning before, it's like, we're still very much in the thick of things. So we don't really look back too much. It's just kind of, that's just, a, we haven't really stopped being in that, in that mode, in that sense. You know, we, we get in writing mode, we move forward, we tour, we, you know, as we're doing right now and so forth. And then we disappear and then we kind of go into our own, like, you know, worlds. And then we start, you know, writing again and repeat. And so I hadn't, I haven't really thought about that much it's been amazing um it's certainly been fun like talking about some of those things and i you know and it's it's incredible to see people's reaction and curiosity about them yeah 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 i i i, it, I found it a, a right riveting read which is a, a cliched phrase but it was the real page turners oh blimey <laughs> and and you know some quite dark times uh, are discussed in it um but it is fascinating to think that you were looking for bandmates couldn't find bandmates and these other young people also trying to get involved in music similar approach trying to find the right people and and i like all those those early stories and even from the conversation tonight i think anybody starting out would take so many lessons from what you're saying about perseverance about uh, not being defeated by constant rejection about being able yeah. to kind of steal yourself and push on and also the idea that you know you wanted to find the people you found the people and something like pda which we heard earlier um was one of the first things you created created with this in mind and that it had such legs you know it went on to be you know a cornerstone of of interpol's work you know which is yeah amazing. it's a hard thing when you're like i mean it's it's when you're in the middle of doing these things and then you just you know it's uh it's very easy to despair like when you're a young band trying to do this and after a while you just kind of because it takes so much effort i mean it's you know in the early days for us even just to say a band because it's young men with no money rehearsal spaces cost so much money no one's coming to your shows you know and and you have you know and you have different interests and so forth for you know diverse interests and you know, I really wanted a band, like I was saying, but it wasn't like those other guys. I mean, when Sam joined the band, Sam had played and Sam joined like in 2000, in 2000 and uh, he, he played in several bands, obviously. And uh, so he or he's already very much a band person. Uh, but like, you know, Paul and Carlos were, you know, they 
they, they like music. Like Paul was definitely interested in music, but they hadn't really thought about necessarily being in a band. And Carlos had kind of like hung up playing music. So it was kind of like, it takes a lot to keep people into, you know, this something where it feels like it's just bleeding money. You know, no one's coming to your shows. The re- all the gear in the rehearsal space that you're renting by the hour is like breaking every, you know, minute. All this and that. It's like, you know, and it's just not, it's like, why am I doing this? So it takes a lot just to keep it together. So it's a hard thing to do. And then also, but I do, I, I read this summer, I remember like, and it, did, it gave me a little bit of courage, like as just like a, uh, it was just kind of like, you know, someone said, like another musician, musician said who had you know, more established, like an established musician, I should say at the time, said something, you know, I, I, I believe that good music will be heard. You just have to keep doing it, you know, and it, I, it's something that I kind of held on to. It's like, if you just keep doing it, sooner or later it'll be heard. Whether it's true or not, it's sort of like just the idea of faith that that's, that's just something you have to do if you want to do this. And ultimately you just have to do it because you love it and, and, and that's what you want to do. And like I said, I remember very clearly, you know, probably like in 2000 or something like that, when we were in a good moment of writing and so forth and hitting our stride as far as writing material that would end up on Bright Lights. But still, no one was coming to our shows and we, no record label was really interested in us. And leaving rehear- like a particularly good rehearsal, feeling really like, you know, kind of excited about like something we were just working on. And then find this kind of like comfort, uh, like, well, if no one ever hears this, I'm getting something out of it. And that's just enough. And I, I think I was at peace with that because I, and I think I found the peace because it wasn't coming, you know, the, it, I had to find the peace if I wanted to keep doing this because I didn't have much hope the other way, you know, the other way that sooner or later someone's going to actually care about what we're doing. So it was more of like, you're doing this for you and then that's okay. Yeah, yeah. And now 20 years later, you're still doing it for you and but a lot more people <laughs> care and pay attention and uh, there's a, a demand, you know, it means that you can uh, do that 15th anniversary tour that you did where you played the whole of that debut album, you know, from start to finish and people wanted that, people were lapping that yeah. up, but also then move on and, and do new records. And of course, um, we're speaking ahead of Glastonbury. You're playing at Glastonbury this weekend. um, And then you're going across pretty much the whole of Europe, is it? It's it's a lot of different dates. Yeah. And then a massive, (laughs) massive US and North American tour. Yeah. Um, So now that you're in that zone, um, how do you cope? And how do you then view the the next step for the band in terms of recording and, and will, are you going to have a break up by the end of the year? Will you think, right, Interpol's rested now for another couple of years? I don't know. You know, I, I, the one thing constant with our band is that we don't plan or discuss what we should do, what we should do. I think we just kind of keep it in the short term and I think it's it's served us well. So, you know, like as you're mentioning, we have a, quite a bit of tour dates and things to do and then, you know, we're going to... And then we're playing Mexico in 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 November, and I'll, you know that'll be one of our that'll be the last shows that we do for this this year and so forth. And that's and it's a wonderful place to play, and I'm really really excited about that. And, and um, but that's as far as like my brain has gone to that. And then you know you there's things that you just leave the subconscious to do. You know like kind of writing, getting ideas, and so forth. And then you know when after a little bit of break and so forth, you you, you kind of reconvene and you do things. But ultimately, I think when you're in the the throes of it, it's better to kind of stick to the you know, every day, yeah, <laughs> day yeah. by day is kind of important <laughs> on the schedule. So, you know, like, I mean, we were discussing this before I, we started this interview, but I was in three cities in one day yesterday. So it's kind of like that sort of thing where you're like, I'm just going to try to get through today and then we'll see about tomorrow. You know, I think it's, it's a, it's a healthy way of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. Um, interestingly, only a few weeks ago, you played All Points East in London, um, in May and on the same bill were the Strokes and yeah. the Raconteurs. Um, and people were talking afterwards, uh, about, Oh wow! This is like a, a, the meeting of the minds from the the <laughs> era. You know the the kind of uh, I don't know new rock and roll era that mm. that emerged in that time. It, when you were there, did you see any of those people? Did you oh, yeah. chat to them? Oh yeah, it was it was it was. I mean, you know, it was um, it was great. A there's the I, that festivals. It's I think they did a really good job, and just in and just for the artists, it's uh, they had in a really sort of artist like a congregating artist friendly way so it's hard not to see a lot of people when you got out of your trails and so forth so yeah it was really nice seeing the raconteurs guys and the strokes guys and and it's interesting what bonds you together it's like even with the strokes it's you know we we're always lumped in together in the early days and and at the same time i you know it was more of like you're you're learning about this band through 
you know, early press as well, you know, before you got signed, you're like, well, how is this band, you know, who is this? But the reason why something like that can happen back then is this pre-social media, the internet hadn't quite taken hold as far as this complete practicality. It was there, you know, you could email and do things like that, but they, you know, people hadn't really, you know, websites weren't really gearing things together and so forth. There wasn't real time. You know, like for us to actually try to get signed, we had to actually physically send something in the mail to someone and wait for a response back, you know. Could be through email, don't get me wrong, but it was it was more like that way. So something could exist, like, you know, under under your nose as well, you knowing about it mm. in a city like New York. It's just something like that. So you have these other bands, ha you know, going on and doing things from the Yes and, and the Strokes and so forth. And it was it's exciting, but I think that's why all these bands sound very separate from each other. Or one of the reasons maybe is because we didn't know about each other. It wasn't a scene, so we can romanticize it now about like us all congregating in the same bar. But I think we're all going to bars, but not always the same bars, you know, doing things. And sometimes there'd be some overlap. I remember seeing the yes and stuff like that out back in the day, but it's the kind of thing that you learn about these bands, you know, and this is what makes it interesting too when you listen to these, this, this music. It's like all those bands that, you know, people talk about from that time, they're all great bands and they all make great, you know, they, they're making or they have made great records and that's just, it's, it's a pretty incredible chapter, but uh, I think it'd be hard to do that now in the sense that you can, you know, everything's real time. In a wonderful way, you can, you know, you can find out about a band in Indonesia and, you know, just like that. So, or someone can share something. Um, but it's not, it's just a different time period. You know, it's hard to like explain what mm. that was versus this time because it's, it's just, we moved on. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it, it must have been surprising to see them all backstage. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I should have, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, also the nice thing though, I guess was with the, the strokes is more of a, you got lumped in together. So then it makes you have something connected, even though you didn't know each other back then when, when you were being lumped in together. But over time since then, it's you've gotten to know them and some maybe some of the guys maybe more than others. And then it is something that bonds you together with the, you know, it's something I've definitely spoken about with those guys here and there about those times and so forth. So it's interesting having that sort of, it's an experience that only you guys can have, you know, yeah. that you guys can sort of understand. But yeah, it was really nice seeing them and, uh, and the raconteurs and hanging out a little bit and just catching up really. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But it's that, that, you know, if generations are lucky, they have their own music for their generation, and you know, you help to provide that. The interesting thing is, as a slightly older person, is seeing how now some bands from that era, you're now the new generation of elder statesmen, young elder statesmen, to the new teenage generation who are discovering, you know, Arctic Monkeys for the first time, getting involved in those, and they go, oh, Arctic Monkeys like the Strokes, we'll listen to them, and, and mm -hmm. you know, they, they, it, and this is how these younger faces are appearing at your shows, but it, it's almost as if, you know, you've now taken on the mantle of the Stones or the Beatles or the Who of that kind of era to the punk generation or the generation of the in the 80s. You know, those were the kind of elder bands who were actually, you know, when we look back, actually they're only in their 30s by the time um, punk and, and then post-punk and then New Wave arrived, but they were regarded as very old. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and I'm not saying you... No, 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 but, no. But it's kind of interesting. You, yeah. You no, know, they're still around. Obviously, people still yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, love their music. But yeah, you've kind of taken on um, because you've persevered. You know, there's lots of full people who've fallen by the wayside, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's wild. I mean, it's just wild. In one way, it doesn't feel like it's been that long, you know? Mm -hmm. But then you're like, okay, well, uh, six records, you know, everything that goes with a record, all the touring, all the places, all the people that have come into your lives too, the experiences that have been gathered through touring throughout the world and wonderful richness that comes with that. So then it starts adding up when you really reflect upon it, but it's still like, it just kind of feels like, it feels like yesterday. I mean, when we were talking about a lot of this stuff, it feels like yesterday, it feels very recent and personal, you know, like mm -hmm. really just sort of a, a vital part of your, or your life and your core. So it's, it's strange, but I think in that way, these are reasons why kind of we're still able to keep moving forward is because we, we don't, they feel like yesterday and consequently we're still thinking about tomorrow, you know, about what we want to do next in that sense. So those things are facts, what you're saying for sure. Um, but then ultimately it's kind of like finding the balance between, wow, that is, you know, all the things that have happened and then also just kind of keeping your head moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, as as somebody who's been playing the music over years, uh, I've loved the way that you connected because with, with, people you know and and it's only through meeting you know some people you think oh wow and they worship interpol you know they worship your work and uh, being in a radio studio on your own playing records you, you don't always <laughs> realize this that the songs that you're playing are really connecting with people and then you know you, you meet 
those people at a later date and and you realize that wow you know th- this stuff that uh, I've been helping to share, you know, has really connected and really lifted people in, in such a special way. You know, and you must feel that every night when you're performing these songs and looking out at the crowd and seeing people, you know, hug themselves with joy uh, and as they sing along. To yeah, to me, it's, it's something that I, I feel like the more and more we've done this, the more and more I really just feel very humbled about that. Because at the end of the day, you know, you create something and then someone's having this visceral reaction to it and it's there's a very few things in life that you, that you can find a, a similarity to that experience you know and it's wild it's just a wild thing to have this communication and this uh with, with people through playing music i don't know it's something that if you really break it down it's just sort of it, it is humbling and it does humble me up there when i'm playing and it's something that I just boil down while playing sometimes so like this is amazing that person especially something maybe that you just created mm. like a new thing and all of a sudden someone's owning it you know very personally more than you're even playing it in that sense and it's theirs more than it's yours and it's just it's a wild experience you know I would never want to be jaded about that I would never be able to like rolling my eyes or just kind of like going through the motions because you should be you, you know you should savor that and you should be like really you should be very much in the moment because if not then I feel like it's just going th- I don't know it just feels like it's a, it's it's your loss for one and then it makes everything more difficult if you're gonna go on stage and just go through the motions every day and just be detached and I feel like it's it's it'd be a lot harder for me to do that than just actually be very present and feel very much in the moment and you know and have that connection because it's it is wild at the end of the day and it's a crazy thing and it's it's it you know it turns my head every single time actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels great, you know, to for, from my perspective to have felt lucky enough to to be able to have played this music, for it to have connected with the generation, and to have watched, you know, Interpol grow from you know that that time at the Barfly through to now um, is is fantastic, and to still have you making music and out there touring and uh, it's it's really exciting. So I've, I've been <laughs> really pleased to be able to get you in the studio tonight, Daniel. Uh, thanks very much for well, coming in. Thanks for all your support over all you know all, all the years, and thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Fantastic. I'm going to play one more track. Uh, this is Stay in Touch. That's the message. I love this one. Um, <laughs> <see you soon. laughs> it is Interpol on Radio X. Interpol with Stay In Touch from the Marauder album and hopefully Daniel will stay in touch. Great to catch up, great to reminisce, uh, great to hear all those stories and some interesting um, uh, band and music career advice, I think, there in what Daniel had to say. Um, Excellent stuff. And um, thanks again to Daniel for coming in and catching up with me. Um, at the end of last week and a quick hello to Colin who got in touch to say I remember when Interpol played Exposure Live one of my best gigs ever I remember buying their four track EP on Chemical Underground with a silver cover Um, excellent thanks very much for that Colin on the way in just a moment the new single from Tame Impala and then the last of those session tracks from Egyptian Blue Exposure with John Kennedy Radio 